Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Tina. Happy birthday to you. Woo, make a wish. I don't know what I'm waiting Woo! for. Love's gonna come my Woo! way. Good job. Run, 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 run. Oh, 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 it's gonna come out. Done with my first year of grad school. Oh, 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 it's gonna come my way. I don't know what I'm waiting for. Love's gonna come my way. Ah! Oh, 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 it's gonna come my way. That's a whole for. thing. Love's gonna come my way. Uh, and you're not coughing. <laughs> oh, 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 it's gonna come my way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 it's gonna come my way. I see the hope in the sunlight. I see the light in the sea. Oh, and the yes, final nice. number was 80 for an FEV one. I am oh, my just, goodness. Her lung I'm function. blown away. That is 24% increase. I thought, good job. <laughs> my goal was 50%. My first one was 51%. <laughs> you beat your goal. <laughs> Love's gonna come my way. Come my way. Grace D'Amico, I'm 18 years old, and I just committed to my dream college. You wanna uh, take a run with me? Hi, I'm Taylor, and this is my husband Damien, and we're celebrating our two-year wedding anniversary by going on a hike. So last time I had you at 73%, okay? Today, I have you 94. <gasps> I'm presently illustrating commissions, and I'm also working on my first children's book that's due to be out later this year. Hello, everyone. Uh, they purposely didn't show me that video. That was just awesome. Um, welcome, and I will open the way I always do with a, just a huge thank you. Thank you for being part of this incredible CF community. Thank you for dialing in, and Happy New Year. It is, um, it's great to see you all. I got to put the big quote marks around that C. Um, it was awesome. I hope many of you joined early enough to see that great scrolling list of our volunteers from every chapter who won the CF Star Award, the CF Hero Hope Award, the Gifts for a Cure Award, they personify what it is to be a part of this incredible community. I also want to thank all of our corporate champions. Their support continues to drive our mission forward, and they stuck with us throughout all of the challenges of the past year. If you can give all of those folks um, a huge round of applause in the chat, I am sure they would appreciate it, and they are certainly oh so deserving. And um, Obviously, I think we all wish that we were together in person. This is normally a time of year where many of us get to fly around the country and get to visit with you and see you and, and hear from you uh, and learn from you and be inspired by you. Um, but we're hoping that you can come away from tonight, you know, feeling informed and feeling hopeful. So I want to give you a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So first of all, please remember to change your chat settings. A lot of you chat to just panelists because that's the way that's the way this thing defaults. But if you could go down to the bottom of your screen and click on panelists and attendees, that way everyone can see the chat. The chat is so busy, it's making me dizzy over here. Um, the chat is being moderated tonight by our fabulous colleague, Molly Riley. Um, if you have questions, we have set aside some time at the end to answer those questions. So type them in to the Q&A box, okay? Um, not into the chat box, but into the Q&A box. And our colleague, Sarah Alsbach, is going to facilitate the Q&A at the end of this. Um, 2020, 
I'm not really sure what we can say. Um, a lot of what I would say about that year, I don't think I could say on this open line. Um, to say it was challenging, I think would be a real significant understatement. Um, but this community, um, as you saw at the very beginning with the happy birthday in the video, we celebrated our 65th anniversary. And I, I certainly don't need to explain to you the significance of 65 in this community. That celebration, that is a celebration of you. That is a celebration of the incredible CF community. None of the progress over the past 65 years would have been possible without you. Um, 2020 was a test. It was a test of the strength of that community and the unique ways in which we had to connect and engage and be resilient. And I think it was also proof that as it has for over 65 years, no matter what's in front of this community, they overcome the challenge. I think if anything, this community and those of us privileged enough to work on your behalf, we feel stronger and more committed than we ever have before. Um, we had to respond to challenges that were unrelated to the pandemic. We took important steps this year to address um, and understand how race impacts life with CF, to address health disparities, to build an inclusive community for every person with CF. And we have some work to do. Um, we did continue to move our mission forward across all three areas of our strategic plan, cure, care, and community. So uh, later on in this, in this in tonight, we're gonna be joined by Dr. Bruce Marshall, who will talk to you about care, Dr. Bill Skatch, who will talk about scientific progress. Our president and CEO, Mike, Dr. Mike Boyle, will bring it all together, and then we'll all join to take some questions. Um, I think I have the best job of the night because what I get to do is, is tell stories about you. I get to talk about what you, this community, did. Um, and what you as a community did, despite the challenges of 2020, was nothing short of stunning. So I'm just going to start um, with the fact that we have... Uh, we have, we have received our final numbers from 2020. And I can tell you that when last March, when we shut down all fundraising and made a conscious decision to focus only on engagement, to focus on the well being of the CF community, we had no idea what would happen with our ability to fundraise in 2020. And um, despite a pause of three months, we raised almost $74 million in 2020. I cannot begin to tell you how amazing that is, how remarkable you are. Um, after that pause, we kicked off the restart of our peer-to-peer -peer fundraising with a wonderful celebration of that 65th anniversary on June 5th. And we celebrated all that we did on peer-to-peer -peer on October 6th. Um, I think one of the most exciting events of the year um, and a shout out to every adult with CF that's on this call, a group of them got together and came to us and said, we want to launch a campaign and it's going to be called Rose Up. And Rose Up was nothing short of amazing. It raised $100,000, but I think more importantly, it engaged over 1,300 people across all 50 states. It's a grassroots movement. We can't wait to see how it's going to continue to grow over time. And like a lot of the, the lessons that we learned, we made some lemonade out of some lemons and we hope to take those lessons and apply them in the future. In November, um, we had a really special opportunity to honor our former CEO, Dr. Preston Campbell. That special opportunity was our first ever virtual Breath of Life Gala, and we raised $5 million. Again, all thanks to you. Uh, it was a fun night. It was hosted by a CF dad, Matt Rogers, and we were joined by longtime supporters like Robin Treadway and Victoria Shaw and Louis Black. The event was remarkable. Locally, we hosted more than 950 virtual events. Uh, in, in, in the 65 Roses Challenge, virtual advocacy, advocacy events, great strides, pep rallies, story hours, and I, of course, have to mention happy hours. Uh, my guess is a number of the people in the chat right now who some of these names I recognize, you're probably having a happy hour as I speak. So we know that all of you participated with your chapter, dedicated your time, your energy, your talent to bring all of this to life in this very, very strange year. So thank you. Um, we also had some national gatherings. Uh, we had our first virtual volunteer leadership conference. Uh, as some of you may recall, that was it was planned for in-person. We had to pull the plug on it. Uh, we held it on March 13th, which was the last day that foundation staff worked in our offices. Um, and we connected and we said, we're gonna continue to connect and we're gonna continue to engage and we're gonna continue to support. We held ResearchCon, which had almost 1500 participants, BreatheCon, 323 adults with CF participated in BreatheCon this year. 
And then in the fall, we had our first ever virtual North American CF conference, NACFC. Three days of live scientific updates, month long access to presentations, 6,000 registrants. And you can go to our YouTube, YouTube channel and see any of those presentations anytime you would like. They're all available. It was a remarkable year. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a bit more about advocacy in a really important part of 2020 and honestly continuing in 2021 is raising our voices before policymakers and advocating for the needs of people with CF and their families. I just wanna give you a few examples of some of the stuff that happened with advocacy. Back in June, first ever virtual teen advocacy day. It was the largest teen advocacy day we'd ever had. Over 200 people attended. I think what was really special for us was that nearly half of them were teens with cystic fibrosis. And in the past, when we've done that event, of course, we've only been able to have one. So it was a special event. When state budgets came under fire, you raised your voice in support of continued funding for CF-related programs. Since April, more than 16,000 messages have been sent to Congress asking for extended paid leave during the pandemic. 16,000. We're continuing to advocate with the Biden administration and the new Congress on the importance of this policy. Many of you reached out and our unbelievable colleagues at Compass um, took your calls. We fielded more than 7,500 calls and emails um, on a range of issues, insurance, school, support services. And today we're advocating across all 50 states for priority access to the vaccine, which I know is on so many of your minds. So as, as I've said, and as you'll hear more about shortly, while there might've been a pandemic, there was social unrest, and there were lots of challenges confronting the foundation in this community, our collective mission continues to be driven forward. We've learned a ton. We've engaged with new people. We found more ways to connect with people with CF. And perhaps, just perhaps, we have a little bit of a better understanding of what they experience with infection control. And we hope that when we come out the other side of this, and we will, that we'll take those lessons and make us even better than we were before. We couldn't do any of this without your ongoing support. So thank you, thank you, and thank you again. I'm sure you wanna hear about the science and about the care. That's what you always wanna hear about. Uh, if you've attended a research event in the past, you may recall that we're required to remind you that the foundation may receive royalties or other revenue if the research we're funding leads to approved therapies in the future. I also wanna make sure that you know that none of our speakers tonight have any personal financial interest in any of the companies that are pursuing the projects you'll be hearing about. Um, I get to close the same way that I opened with a thank you. Um, you, this incredible CF community, you're the engine and the inspiration for everything that those of us privileged to work on your behalf do. We were able to remain steadfast and accomplish so much because of you and your shared belief in our mission. You continue to be the authors of the most amazing story in medicine today. Uh, it's now my pleasure to hand off the, the proverbial screen and, and microphone to Dr. Bruce Marshall. Bruce. Thank you, Mark. I was feeling very calm and confident about this presentation until I glanced down at the bottom of the screen and I see over 1,000 participants. I had to take a few deep breaths, but welcome to everybody and thank you all. CF care centers are really the backbone of the advances that we've been able to make in CF and 2020 was no exception with the rapid changes in care due to the COVID pandemic. I will address the impact of the pandemic but start with some exciting findings from our registry in the first full year of Trikafta in clinical practice. As most of you know, Trikafta was approved by the FDA for people with CF 12 years of age and older towards the end of 2019. We heard very encouraging stories, but it wasn't until 2020 that we actually had data from the CF Foundation Patient Registry, which tracks the treatment and outcome trends of 85% of people with CF in the US. And I'm gonna highlight three exciting findings from that data to get us started tonight. First, this first slide shows IV treated pulmonary exacerbations, very important events, often associated with loss in lung function. This slide shows the number of exacerbations across the entire care center network. 
a lot of events. And the yellow line shows a marked drop over several months following FDA approval of Trikafta and before the onset of the pandemic. Profound drop in exacerbations, an amazing finding. The second finding relates to the impact of Trikafta on those with advanced lung disease. In 2020, there were 76 transplants for CF as compared to an average of 240 per year for CF from 2010 to 2019. That's a stunning 68% decrease in CF lung transplants in 2020, almost certainly related to Trikafta. Now there, there was a 6% decrease in the overall number of transplants in 20, 2020, likely related to the pandemic, but that certainly does not explain the marked decrease in CF transplants. Now this is great news, but we know that transplant will remain a vital option for some individuals with CF. We're committed to helping people with CF at every stage of their journey. So we have continued to increase our investment in transplant. We've recruited the top transplant centers in North America, and they've done great work in improving the transplant referral process. We're also making remarkable progress in building out the infrastructure to support care and research for advanced lung disease and transplant. I'm really excited about our potential to make a big difference in this area. Now the third and final finding uh, from the data was, is one that we didn't really anticipate, an increase in the number of pregnancies. 412 pregnancies reported in the 2020 registry data thus far. That's a 60% increase from the average of 255 pregnancies per year from 2010 to 2019. Is this a Trikafta baby boon? Well, we're not exactly sure. We've all been spending much more time at home. So this may be a pandemic baby boom or perhaps a combination of the two factors. Regardless of the underlying reason, I interpretate, interpret this as a hopeful sign of progress. Now there's another really exciting Trikafta milestone on the horizon. The study in six to 11 year olds was completed. And just this week, Vertex announced that they submitted an application to the FDA. We anticipate FDA approval by June, an exciting development. Our goal is the safe use of modulators in younger and younger age groups. We believe this may prevent onset of the many manifestations of the disease. Imagine a person with CF not needing airway clearance, not needing pancreatic enzymes or inhaled therapies, not needing hospitalizations. It's really exciting to imagine such a future. Now, Trikafta is clearly a game changer for many people with CF, but we know that some have experienced side effects and others have not responded as well as expected. Bill will share our work to support the development of new CFTR modulators. He will also talk about the recent FDA approval of CFTR modulators for some additional rare mutations. So look forward to that. Now it's hard to top Trikafta, but we can't ignore the COVID pandemic. It took over our lives. The pandemic created turbulence in our entire healthcare system including the disruption of our CF care centers. Some CF clinicians were redeployed to care for COVID patients. Others were furloughed. The usual in-person clinic visits were halted or severely restricted. This next slide will show a dramatic drop off in clinic visits and then a more gradual increase in telehealth visits. And here's that slide. You can see there between March and April with the onset of the pandemic, that dramatic drop in the blue line in terms of the number of clinic visits, in-person clinic visits, and the yellow line showing a gradual increase. 
in the telehealth visits. CF care teams had to make this shift to telehealth with very little experience and minimal preparation. This is where we stepped in. We've supported the care center teams by helping in this transition to telehealth. We leverage the power of a national network by sharing of learnings through a series of town halls. We developed and disseminated a, tele, a telehealth index with best practices curated from the work of care centers at the leading edge of this transition to telehealth. And by centralizing the procurement of home spirometers, which at the time were in scarce supply, we've distributed nearly 17,000 home spirometers to people with CF so they could monitor their lung function and share that data with their care teams. One clinician expressed her gratitude for the spirometers by commenting that without spirometry data, she was flying blind. Now, nearly all CF Foundation accredited care centers are providing some form of telehealth services while also integrating in-person visits for those who need to come in. Despite the disruption, there may be a silver lining here. In our strategic planning, we envision a future CF care model with a combination of telehealth and in-person visits to serve a growing and healthier population of people with CF. We are capturing what our care center staff, people with CF and their families, and what we at the foundation have learned about telehealth through a formal evaluation process led by our colleagues at Dartmouth. We believe the insights gained from this evaluation and our collective experience will jumpstart our thinking and planning for a future CF care model. Now we've also helped the care centers through our ongoing financial support. First, we provided flexibility in how they could spend their center grant to meet their own specific needs. Our additional financial support for mental health has enabled many centers to add a mental health professional to their care team. With the stress and anxiety on patients and families, as well as the care teams, this has proven to be a very wise investment. The Emory CF Care Center used foundation funding to add a mental health professional to their team, and it's really made a difference. This is a quote from one of the, their adults with CF. Quote, I would not have taken the time to explore my mental health had you not been a part of my care team. I am still working towards better mental health and self-care but I wanted you to know that I see you and recognize what you do. Super grateful." End quote. And a final example of how we've supported the care centers is simply my, by maintaining open lines of communication. We are keeping CF care team members, nearly 4,000 of them, updated with the latest on COVID and related resources through a succinct weekly email. And I think we're close to hitting 50 weeks at this point. We're holding open forums for care team members so they can share concerns with us and with one another through this very stressful time. We've deployed listservs so clinicians in our care center network can seek answers to specific questions and build upon each other's work, saving valuable time and resources. This ongoing dialogue has been very helpful in keeping our finger on the pulse so that the multidis multidisciplinary care teams can continue providing specialized CF care, whether online or in person, always in partnership with their patients and families. Now, speaking of patients and families, I will close by spending a few minutes on the direct impact of COVID on people with CF and the resilience of our community. We are closely tracking the number of COVID cases in the US through our patient registry and around the world through an international working group. As of yesterday, 984 confirmed COVID cases have been entered into our registry. That's about 3% of the CF patient population in the US. Still less than half the infection rate 
in the overall US population. Of the 984 cases, about 72% are adults and 28% children. 17% of the adults and 10% of the children have been hospitalized. We feared the worst, so we were somewhat relieved to see the early data, but it's certainly not all good news. There have been five COVID-related deaths in the US, including one reported just yesterday. All were adults with CF, three who had received a lung transplant and two who had advanced lung disease. Now, Dr. Fauci has warned us of a long, hard winter, but vaccination may be the light at the end of that COVID tunnel. That said, we know that the rollout of the vaccines has been confusing, chaotic, and much slower than we expected. We know that many of you are angry and very frustrated about this. We know that people with CF need a vaccination strategy that's aggressive, predictable, and adheres to the science. I want you to know that advocating for people with CF to gain early access to vaccination has been and continues to be a top priority for the CF Foundation. Under the leadership of Mary Dwight and her team, we've taken advantage of every opportunity to forcefully advocate for CF through letters and testimony before committees. We've engaged with federal and state decision makers. We've testified before the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, referred to as ACIP. This is an esteemed group of experts that make recommendations about vaccine use in the US. In December 2020, the ACIP issued recommendations for allocation of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which support prioritized access for those with high-risk medical conditions, including CF. However, the ACIP recommendations are not mandates. States, counties, and healthcare institutions all have a say in determining who and when people will be able to access the vaccines. To that point, we recently called on the Biden administration to strongly encourage states to follow the ACIP recommendations in their vaccination implementation plans. Again, we recognize that many of you are angry and very frustrated, and we share your frustration Many of us have elderly parents or family members with high risk conditions. I assure you that the CF Foundation is fully engaged on this issue, actively monitoring at the federal and state levels and advocating for CF at every opportunity. A final suggestion for people with CF and their families, please stay in close contact with your CF care teams regarding COVID vaccination. And with that, I turn the microphone over to my colleague, Dr. Bill Skatch. So thank you, Bruce. And congratulations, what a fantastic year. You know, Despite the widespread effects of the pandemic, as Bruce and Mark have said, the research efforts have had robust growth throughout 2020. And I want to kind of cover a little bit of that right now. We funded over 1,300 academic awards to researchers and clinical care centers, the most we've ever funded, and $185 million. This is due to the hard work of a phenomenal grants team program officers, dedicated research community that all worked together to make sure that even under remote conditions, we held our review sessions, we got our award letters out, and we did our absolute best to keep the labs operating and functional and moving forward. The total budget for the medical, for the medical program was a record $245 million, including the money and the resources that we provided to industry programs. 
This is over $50 million more than we funded in 2019. And again, this went to all facets of the, of the mission, care centers, clinical researchers, basic researchers, the TDN, looking at all of the things that Bruce talked about as well as the basic research that's going on. And this is really because of all of your hard work. So I really wanna to say to everyone out there, thank you, thank you for everything you did last year, for everything you continue to do this year. But it was a tough year, there's no question. We closed our own research lab in, in Lexington, Massachusetts for three months from March to June. It reopened in June and it's still running only at 50% capacity. The academic community had a very tough time. Many labs got shut down due to, due to sheltering. Many labs are open now and only running at partial, uh, at partial capacity. And to really make sure that we could protect our research community, we, we increased our communication with the community. We changed some of the policies that we have for flexibility and funding. We opened up bridge funding. We developed newsletters, town halls to really communicate and reach out to the community to find out what they were struggling with. Because our goal was really to protect the research community. We need those researchers and we did not wanna see labs suffer unduly. They're responsible for the breakthroughs and the progress in so many areas. So we are very pleased and we think this was well appreciated. The communications we've had with the community have been extremely appreciative in all that we've done. What I'd like to talk to you about for the next few minutes is really three main areas, the big wins that we saw for, for people with CF in 2020. I'm gonna first talk a little bit about modulator therapy. You heard some from Bruce and I'll give you an update on a couple of things there. Some of the advances that we have in addressing the daily complications of people with CF and then finally talk a little bit about what we're doing to accelerate the path to a cure. Our goal for modulators is to get more modulators to more people. In other words, everyone that could benefit from a modulator should be able to have a modulator. And Bruce talked about how Vertex is working to expand modulators to younger age groups, which is really critical. There's three clinical trials I wanna just quickly talk about, um, and that's Promise, Begin, and Simplify that really are trying to understand how well modulators work in the real world. PROMISE is the biggest study we've ever undertaken at the CF Foundation, and its goal is to look at the effects of Trikafta. People are enrolled before they go on Trikafta, and then they're followed after they go on Trikafta. And despite all the troubles of 2020, we completely enrolled the, the study and actually had enough data to present the early preliminary results at the North American Conference. This is over 450 patients, and we saw in real world setting of their clinical care centers, a dramatic increase in FPV1, a 38 milliequivalent drop in sweat chloride, and a 12 point improvement in the CFQR. Promise started out with 12 years and older individuals and is now moving into enrolling patients that, have, that are six to 12 years old. And the BEGIN trial will extend that study to really examine people that are one to five years old to find out what happens when modulators that are very effective like Trikafta are given very early in life. Simplify is an entirely new kind of study for the CF Foundation. It actually is trying to decrease the burden of treatment. For many, many years, we've been trying to find new drugs and new treatment and just adding them on. And everyone in the CF knows how much work it takes just to get their daily activities done with all of the medications and treatments. Simplify is now taking a little bit of a different look to say, can we start cutting back? Trikafta is so effective, we might be able to cut back on really time consuming treatments like Pulmazyme and DNA, uh, Pulmazyme and hypertonic saline. But we wanna do that safely. And before we can recommend that, we need to understand, is it safe and for which people? So Simplify also started to enroll in 2020 and it's 25% finished, 25% uh, enrolled now. Another thing we're doing is trying to, again, ensure that everyone that can benefit from a modulator gets access to modulators. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we've been doing through therotyping. In December, the FDA ruled to increase the number of mutations that are qualified for modulators from 39 mutations to 183 mutations. This was done through what we call therotyping where a mutation is studied in the laboratory and tested whether or not it responds to a particular drug or combination of drugs. And we use that information now to test, to predict whether or not people 
will benefit from the, from the therapy in the clinic. And the FDA is now taking that data purely from the laboratory and using it to improve and expand the label. This increased the availability of modulators to more than 600 people with CF. And many of these mutations are extraordinarily rare with only a handful of people in the country. The, no, the, the identity of these mutations is available on cff.org on the CFTR modulators page, if you're interested in looking. And we're not done yet. We have 400 more mutations that the lab is testing. And we're working now to run through that data. We finished the initial, the initial results. We're gonna meet with Vertex and talk to them. Only Vertex can actually submit the data to the FDA. So it's very important that we work to them to try to make sure that even more mutations can be added to the label. And Bruce mentioned new modulators. We're not finished with modulators. There's companies that are now bringing forward better modulators with more activity, even than Trikafta. This will provide choice for people that don't respond as well as others. And it will also provide choice for people that can't take modulators for various reasons, such as allergic reactions or just intolerability. AbbVie is a company that we're working with very closely on this, and they're in phase two trials in 2021 to test their combination of modulators. And one of those is a CF potentiator, a CFF potentiator that we helped develop with Pfizer that we then trans transferred to FB to activate and improve their program. So I wanna turn now to manifestations. And it's really important to address the manifestations of CF, particularly in people without access to modulators. Just in, in 2020, we funded 120 new programs in the Infection Research Initiative. This was an initiative we rolled out in 2018 to specifically work to focus on improving and understanding the outcomes of infections, which is one of the biggest concerns of people with CF. This deals with better ways to diagnose infections, looking at the microorganisms that are involved in those infections and understanding them better, looking at drug resistance and finding ways to treat drug resistance, and developing new antibiotics, expanding the repertoire of drugs that we currently have. We also recognize when COVID started, we didn't know anything about how COVID impacted CF from a biological perspective. So Catherine Tuggle really spearheaded and put together a, research, a request for applications. We funded $2.7 million specifically dedicated to understanding how the COVID virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, impacts CF cells, CF tissues and airways, impacts CF inflammation. And those, were funded, those awards were just funded at the end of last year. Since the Research Infection Initiative was started, we've committed more than $70 million. We had 70 company meetings with, with anti-infective um, industry, industry partners in 2020, 22 new companies that were not even involved in CF before that before. We funded seven new applications to fund new research in new areas. And some of the really exciting programs are finding us uh, uh, as a program, one is a program with Caliber Therapeutics in San Diego to specifically look for drugs that would treat Burkholderia cepatia, a very difficult to treat infection. We have multiple programs now moving forward in phage therapy, where viruses actually attack bacteria and kill bacteria in the lungs. And we wanna know, does that work? How well does it work in CF? We're working on completely novel types of antibiotics, unlike any other antibiotics before that will tackle the real difficult question of multi-drug resistant organisms that cause very difficult to treat infections. And we still have multiple programs going on looking at therapies that could treat non-tuberculous mycobacterium. <clears throat> We're also working with the community to set priorities, understand what the needs are, and really guide this, the, the infection research initiative forward. We have several workshops, that one that took place in 2020, another that will take place in 2021, looking at fungal infections. How do we treat them? How do we diagnose them? What are the best ways to go about that? And it's not just infection, although infection has been a major focus. We're working on better ways to hydrate the airways. We're also looking, working towards a new pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, which is non-porcine non and has the potential to be more effective and a lot more potent. So there's fewer numbers of pills to take every day. And I'll finish by giving you a bit of an update on the path to a cure. While we know that we need to treat the infections, we need to treat the manifestations of CF now because those are the things that are really affecting people today. Our eyes are set toward the future as well. And our goal is ultimately to cure CF. 
And the genetic-based therapies are the best chance to reach that goal. Since we started the Path to a Cure and announced it at North American Conference in 2019, we have had an amazing response from industry. In 2020, we met with 48 companies, 23 of those are brand new to CF, interested in working on mRNA, gene therapy, gene editing. And in just two years, we built a portfolio of 49 industry programs, which are actually under consideration or working with the CF Foundation to decide if CF is where they wanna be. We currently have 17 active contracts in 2020, and with a total commitment toward the path to a cure of $135 million. Seven of these were brand new in 2020, new therapeutic development awards, and we spent over $54 million on path to a cure related programs last year alone. So what are we doing with those programs? Well, we've talked a little bit about mRNA. And one thing that's changed with mRNA is that probably everyone here on the phone now knows and has heard about mRNA because of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. But it's a little bit different to develop a therapy using an mRNA-based vector in CF than it is to develop a, a, a vaccine that will protect you from a virus. Still, our mRNA programs are moving forward Translate Bio is in the phase one study of looking at safety and toxicity in the patients in the clinic. And this slowed down during COVID. It was hit because of enrollment, because clinic visits, it's back up and running. They're enrolled to get the final results of that early trial later this year. And right behind Translate is a company called Arcturus with their own formulation to put mRNA into the lungs of people with CF. And the data from that pro program looks very good. We're very excited about it. And we hope that their early, the preclinical work will finish in 2020, 2021, and they'll be moving into the clinic in 2022. So back, a, a, back, a, a fast follower for Translate. We've also seen advances in our gene therapy programs. 4D Molecular is a Berkeley-based company looking at an adeno-associated viral vector, which will deliver CFTR DNA directly into the cells in the lungs of people with CF. We started with a small program and we were very excited about their data. So in 2020, we accelerated that program with up to $14 million to fund their preclinical development uh, studies and hopefully move that into the clinic by early 2022. Very excited to see that going forward. We also started something brand new, a new program with Longwood the Longwood Fund. This is a venture group in Boston. And their job, their, their, pro, their company is basically built around building companies. They search academic investigators and universities for highly valuable technology. And then they build companies around that technology to develop new drugs for rare diseases. So we had a couple of conversations with the Longwood Fund group and they were very interested in CF. So over the course of 2020, we had multiple meetings, we finalized a contract and where they will now work looking for technology specifically that are dedicated and valuable in this, to the CF community. And most of these technologies that we're highly interested in are on the path to a cure. In just the last few months, we've had some great discussions with them, talking about new areas, new investigators, and really some exciting work coming forward. So they're basically working for us. And if they find something that looks good and we both agree, then we've earmarked $20 million that could be spent for developing these companies and bringing those products forward. This is an area that we'll probably do more of in the future. We wanna make sure we don't miss anything. We wanna make sure that we're funding the best science and the best technology. And companies like Longwood are experts at that. We wanna bring them on our side and use their expertise to build the next generation of CF therapies and really cure this disease once and for all. So looking forward into 2021, there's three areas that I'm most excited about. One is alternative chloride channels being tested, better therapies to hydrate the airways for people without CFTR modulators. For many years, we've been talking about activating CFTR, restoring CFTR, but there are other chloride channels in the lung that we already know about. One of them is the calcium activated chloride channel or TMEM16A, it's got a funny scientific name, but it basically sits in lung cells and it does transport chloride similar to CFTR. And a company called Enterprise has developed a small molecule that can be taken as a drug that activates that chloride channel. So you don't need a modulator to, affect, to increase your CFTR function. And this, we were very excited about our early funding. And in fact, Genentech and Roche were so excited about this program 
that they purchased the program from Enterprise and are now moving it forward into phase two trials right now. So hopefully this year we may get some results on whether or not this will benefit people with CF. It's still early, but it's very exciting. There's another program by Systetic Medicines that's trying to develop an artificial chloride channel that can be inhaled based on the, the antifungal drug, amphotericin. There was a paper that came out a few years ago that was very exciting, and that's moving forward as well. And Ionis is still working and moving forward on its therapy for ENAC inhibition, which is not a chloride channel, but it's a sodium channel, and blocking that channel seems to improve the hydration of, of CF cells in, in, in the lab. And we're hoping this will be another way to improve hydration and mucus clearance in people with CF even before they have a chance to use modulators. Phage therapy is another very important area. A lot of press in the, in the newspapers and lay press. We funded our first clinical trial in phage therapy with a $5 million award to Armada. And they're enrolling patients right now to test whether or not a cocktail of phage, which are really viruses that infect and kill bacteria, will impact people with pseudomonas infections in CF. It's really a completely novel way of going after antibiotics. There's been a lot of talk about phage for many, many years, and what we really need is a good solid clinical trial. And Armada is moving forward with that. And there are several other programs that we're considering that could move forward in the next year or two. And if we look further into the future, one of the most exciting things to me are some really new exciting advances in gene editing. These are technologies that really didn't even exist a few years ago that are now able to target very specific parts of CFTR and put in large pieces of DNA. And what really this allows us to do is to develop a single cure a single treatment that will cure everyone regardless of their mutation. Very exciting, but still very early. We're so excited we're starting, we have a workshop, virtual workshop next week, bringing together about 15 scientists and just talk about this. We have a subsequent summit that we're planning in the fall for a face-to-face -face meeting where we wanna bring companies and researchers together to really see how we can move this forward. I think this has really been on our radar screen to do and the technology just wasn't available. And now it seems like that's happening. So really, really exciting. Um, but it will be a while before we get to the end game. It's still exciting to see the science move forward. So I think you can all agree, 2020 was a good year for progress in our pipeline and our research efforts. But I'm convinced 2021 is gonna be even better. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Mike Boyle who will bring us home with a presentation component of the, of the session, and then we'll open it up for discussion and questions afterwards. Mike? Bill, thank you. And uh, thank you for your work. Fantastic presentation. And Bruce and Mark, thank you for your, your words and, and to the whole CFF team for really a, a, a lot of work done in 2020, despite a lot of challenges, right? But just like everybody else, I want to start tonight with saying uh, thank you to everyone who's online tonight. Now, you've heard so many details about tremendous progress made in 2020. Um, despite a pandemic, right, that's completely changed the way we live our lives. But as Mark said earlier this evening, none of this progress would be possible without you. So particularly in the challenges we've been facing, we're just so grateful to you. So thank you. Thank you, each one of you, for making all this progress in the fight against CF possible. Now, as much as we enjoy sort of looking back and being very proud of our shared progress in 2020, we're a community and an organization that always looks to the future. So let's spend the last part of this evening doing that together. So since becoming CEO, each year at the foundation, I give our team three words to guide us as we head into the new year. These three words are more than just for our staff, however, they highlight the principles that are gonna be essential for us to keep in mind as a community as we head into 2021. Our three words for 2021 are vision, determination, and trust. Let's talk a little bit more about these three guiding words. The first word is vision. It's gonna be essential that as we head into 2021, that we maintain a clear vision on where we're headed together. We're not gonna allow the craziness of 2020 or the challenges we know we're gonna face in 2021, take our eyes off of our ultimate destination. And what is that vision? You know, where are we headed? You've heard a lot about it tonight, right? Really, our vision is clear. Our vision is transformative therapy for all people with CF, no matter what mutations they have, and eventually a cure for CF. Our vision is optimizing CF care so that people with CF can live the longest, healthiest lives possible, 
no matter what challenges they're facing. And our vision is partnering with people with CF wherever they are on their journey and with their families through programs and services that they help shape. So as we head into 2021, let's keep our eyes on this vision of where we're going and what we need to accomplish. The second word is determination. All right, there's no doubt we're gonna face challenges in 2021. We're already starting to face those, right? We've been talking about those tonight. But by holding on to our vision and combining it with determination, we can make 2021 another remarkable year of progress. Now, part of that determination is absolutely gonna be overcoming COVID-19. And together we will overcome COVID-19 in 2021. But the real determination has to be that we're gonna overcome COVID and whatever other surprises come our way in 2021 and not lose focus on pushing forward those highest priority initiatives, which are gonna make such a difference for people with CF and their families. And what are those highest priorities? As we head into this year, I, wanna, I just wanna call those out clearly. These are the highest priorities we have in the three key strategic areas of the foundation, cure, care, and community. So in cure, we are gonna accelerate. We're gonna to continue to accelerate this path to the cure we were just hearing about. We've already made tremendous gains, close to tripling our investments in cure-related research over the past three years. In 2021, the idea is push down the gas pedal even more. This means bringing the best science and the best scientists in the world to focus on CF. It means we're gonna be working on creating specific tools to allow testing and development of that science for CF. It also means pushing ahead on some early stage trials of therapies that can benefit those living with CF no matter what mutations they have. And as Bill mentioned, we're gonna to continue to expand and work or lay the groundwork for expanding the number of available modulators beyond Trikafta and also the number of people who can benefit from modulators, especially those with rare mutations. And then while doing this, we're gonna remain our, maintain that firm commitment to addressing the challenges that many people with CF continue to face, especially in the areas of difficult to treat infections, GI issues, and advanced lung disease. In care, what are these really top priorities for 2021 and beyond? We're gonna to continue to advocate for and support CF care centers during this time and the community so that we can get through COVID-19, get through this pandemic and emerge healthy and thriving. Bruce spoke about the remarkable advances we've made in telehealth in 2020, and we're gonna to continue to build on this. So we've, we're gonna take what we've learned and we're gonna work with care teams and people with CF to begin to shape that best CF care for the future that Bruce was talking about. We're gonna continue, and we didn't really hear too much about this, but we're working right now to develop the next generation of the patient registry. This is gonna collect a broader range of data. It's gonna support the delivery of even better care. And it's gonna give us the ability to have new insights into life with CF. And then we're gonna to continue to advance those trials that we heard about, particularly promise and simplify to really fully understand the full impact of Trikafta. And then what are the key priorities in community? You know, 2020 opened up a whole new world of virtual interactions, right? It sort of changed the way we, we support the community and collaborate with people with CF. I think it's been good for us in some ways. Many of us have had to become familiar with the challenges of distance connections and loss of in-person uh, sort of connections that people with CF have been facing for their entire lives. So I hope it enables us to sort of understand it more and to be able to, to help to sort of understand and to face the same type of challenges. So we're determined to use what we've learned in these virtual interactions to bring the community together more in 2021. We're gonna build on that. We're gonna be more inclusive and supportive of the CF community. You know, Mark mentioned our work to address racial justice. We're gonna continue this. We've also continued to work and help with those who uh, CF really isn't responding to modulators, right? And include them in all that we do. So at the end of the day, the CF Foundation's mission is clear to cure CF, provide all people with CF the opportunity to lead long and fulfilling lives. In 2021, we're gonna reach members of the CF community that we have not been engaged with before and better than before, had an inclusive community that it reaches all of those people we're talking about. So I think you heard it tonight, but there's lots of reason to be excited about uh, lots of things to be excited about in 2021. Now, I hadn't mentioned our last word, that last word for 2021, trust. So at the foundation, we talk about this with our staff and we talk about having trust in the team, in our mission and the plans that we've laid for 2021 and beyond and into the future. But tonight, I wanna to talk about a little different type of trust. It's the trust that together, the CF community 
meaning all of you together with all of us at the CF Foundation are gonna be able to overcome any obstacle that comes our way in 2021 and continue our remarkable progress in the fight against CF. Now, each of us is gonna to have to play our own unique role and contribute in our own unique way, but knowing our track record, and our track record together, knowing each of you, I have complete trust that we're gonna make 2021 another remarkable year of progress. So with that, I'm sure we have lots of questions. I saw them popping up as I was uh, watching along. Um, let's dive into those now. We're willing to go a little over to make sure we address those. I'm gonna invite Bill and Bruce and Mark back onto the camera along with Sarah also. Spock, who's our chief community. Remember, submit those questions on the Q&A section, not the chat, so that we can, so we can get to those. So uh, Sarah, you wanna lead the way? Great, thanks, Mike. Um, and we're getting a, a lot of questions in. A reminder, we can't answer questions that uh, relate to personal health situations. So please, in your uh, phrasing of the question, try to keep it uh, general. We'd love to get to as many as we can um, tonight. Um, one of the top questions that we are getting, um, Mike, and is, um, is anyone doing any work looking into Trikafta and a lower dose, possibly um, the ability to take Trikafta once a day? That seems to be a pretty popular question tonight. Well, so, you know, the, the pharmacokinetics of Trikafta means it needs to be taken twice. You know, it needs to be split up and taken twice a day. I will tell you that there's actually some, being, some drugs that are being developed uh, and Vertex is moving some that would be once a day. And those trials are gonna be going forward in the CFF's therapeutic development network. In terms of just reducing a dose, I, I would really talk to your care team about that. There have been some times where people have had some side, side effects where whatever, and they've worked with having lower doses and then working their way up, but you really wanna be thoughtful about that. And uh, so hopefully that's, those two things sort of answers that question. Great, thanks. Um, Bill, lots of questions. You covered some of this on the work that we're doing on manifestations, and, and you spoke specifically about infection. There are a number of questions about what work we're doing in other manifestations, and specifically GI, CFRD, and liver uh, have been raised. Can you talk about that work? Sure. Um, there just isn't enough time for everything, but there's a lot of work going on in GI and, and diabetes, liver disease. Just to mention a few things, we really spearheaded a group of GI specialists through a program called Digest. This is really to train specialists that can do clinical trials, looking at treatment at GI issues. I mean, they conducted a study called Galaxy, which is the largest study we've ever done to really look at what are the symptoms? How can we kind of categorize them and then really think about how to use science to move forward in developing better treatments? The PUSH study is a study that's looking specifically at CF liver disease trying to find ways of detecting liver disease early. And then if we can do that, move drugs forward to try to prevent the liver disease. Right now, it's very hard to diagnose until it's already occurred. And that's really a very important area. Like GI, there's a group called Envision. And this is really Bruce's team that's really kind of set this up, training physicians in endocrinology to understand the endocrine challenges of people with CF. And then we're also working with, a, as I briefly mentioned, a new pancreatic replacement therapy with a company called Tinspira, that really we haven't had a new pancreatic replacement therapy for decades. And this could be a game changer in terms of the number of pills per day, the effectiveness. And although it's still early, we're very excited about the preliminary data where we just funded multi-million dollar contract to move that forward with this company called Tinspira. So lots going on outside of the pulmonary and, and infection areas that we most frequently talk about. Great, thanks so much. Um, a number of questions um, coming in naturally related to COVID vaccine, specifically, um, and maybe I'll just cover a bunch of them and, and we could sort of talk generally. Um, what do we do and, and what are we doing to support people in states where people with CF maybe aren't as high on, on the vaccine uh, tier? And then some other questions about um, how to determine if you should get the vaccine, specifically if there's some considerations, um, specifically someone inquired about if you were pregnant or if there would be considerations for when you should not get the vaccine. Bruce, you wanna yeah. lead the way? Yeah. yeah, I'll lead off on that one, Mike. Feel free to jump in. But um, you know, for states where CF is not as high on the list, this, this is where Mary and her team really kind of step in. They're really monitoring all the states and there's, there's some hot spots, you know, where where they they're really aggressively uh, tracking um, 
what's happening there. And then the other question about whether you should get a vaccine for the most part, the answer is yes, but there, you know, there are circumstances where you should probably have a conversation with your care team. Regarding pregnancy, you know, there's there's a little bit of controversy about that. You know, the, so I, I think it's one where the individual should consult with their care team and, and uh, really be confident in, in moving forward before they get the vaccine in that circumstance. Um, a number of questions, Bruce, this is actually probably a quick one for you, but I've seen it come up a few times. Um, a number of people were interested in spirometers and uh, how they could get one if they um, don't have one already. Any advice for them? Yeah, this, this goes through the care team. You know, if they ask the care team, the care team submits the request to us and then we process it and the spirometers go directly out to the home of, of that individual or family. So it's all funneled through. It's it sort of is um, what's considered a prescription advice. You might a uh, prescription device. You might say. So the care team, the physician, has to kind of kind of sign off on it. So um, the first the first step is really consult their care team, and they can get get the ball rolling. Great, great. Um, Bill, lots of exciting progress on the path to a cure that you talked about tonight. Um, there were a couple of questions around. How do I find out about research that's happening in specific mutations? Um, and also some interest in the ELOX uh, announcement and the work that we're doing there. Could you talk about both of those? So the research on specific mutations is a really interesting question. And when we thought about it a bit, but it's going on all around the world in all different laboratories. So there is no one place where you can go to find out everything. I would encourage you to check out the CFTR modulators page on our website which does have some of the mutations, but it's a, it's a very good point. And I think I'll take that back to the team and think about what we might be able to do to create some sort of resource where people can find out things. I mean, you can also just type your mutation into Google and it is amazing what you can find because the published work is gonna pop up and you'll be able to read who did what. Um, it works very well. Um, the second question. Um, Elox, can you Elox. give an update on the work happening with Elox? So Elox is a, it's a company based out of, it was it based out of Israel, it's now in the US. They're developing a small molecule that's derived from an aminoglycoside antibiotic that causes read through of premature termination codons or nonsense mutations. So they've been working on developing this drug for many, many years. They are in the clinic with a clinical trial, testing it on patients that have the G542X mutation. And this is a trial that took a hit with COVID. I will be honest with you. It's a small trial, there aren't many patients, but when COVID hit, there just weren't clinic visits and they couldn't enroll patients. So they're back up and running, they're enrolling again, and we will probably get the results of that trial later this year. It's an early trial, a phase one, two. So part of it's looking at safety and part of it is looking at an early read to see whether or not this might, this might be effective. I'll compare it to the Adeloran trial that many of you might remember in the past, which was another small molecule for nonsense that, unfortunately didn't, wasn't, didn't have enough activity for CF. In the laboratory, ELOX has much more activity, no question. The question right now that is trying to be studied is, is it enough activity to really tip the needle and affect people's lung function and help their, help their breathing? And that we're gonna have to wait for for this. But it's moving forward. Later this year, we should be getting the early results. And we hope that it'll then move forward into a larger trial that can actually go for approval. Thanks, Bill. Mark, I think this one is for you. There's some excitement about Rose Up and some interest in how to get involved. Well, there should be some excitement about Rose Up. It's pretty awesome. Um, so I, I would note, I, you know, I, 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 unfortunately, pandemic related, I got to put these on to see the chat, but I am almost positive that I've seen Casey White and Summer Love's name in the chat. They are two of the originators of the idea for Rose Up. But if you'd like to get some information, I just suggest that you contact us, reach out at info at cff.org and we'll put you in touch with folks and, and pay attention to our website because uh, its first year was spectacular and its second year is gonna be better. Awesome, thanks. Um, Mike, the, the very first question I saw this evening in the Q&A actually related to NACFC. Um, and thought you might comment on what are our plans uh, for NACFC for 2021? Right, it's a great question. 
truth is we're already planning this, right? It takes a year to, 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 get, to get this going. And the bottom line is we are absolutely hoping to be together in person, really at the, the last day in September and the beginning of October uh, in San Antonio. And so we're currently planning. However, we, we are absolutely gonna learn lessons from year this year and um, have, are building up the virtual component of that as well. So it's gonna be a hybrid experience. Our hope is to be together in person we're going to, what we're going to do is let safety guide us, right? If we feel like we can do this safety, there is something magical about having the world's best CF doctors and CF scientists and teams be together. And so we want to do that. Um, so that is the plan. And then we're going to respond how data, you know, the data, how vaccines roll out and make sure that we can do it safely. At the same time, we know people won't, some people won't be able to attend. And so we're going to make sure that we have a really rigorous virtual component, uh, both this year and in years going forward. Great. Um, there's a question that, that has gotten some interest, which actually relates to adverse events from Trikafta. And specifically, um, is the foundation looking into some of the reports, uh, particularly related to anxiety and depression um, from those who have taken Trikafta? Sure. Yeah, I can, I can get that started. I mean, we, you know, all this adverse event reporting, it has to go through the sponsor, which is Vertex. Um, we obviously hear about it and, and investigate. And if there's any question, refer them either to Vertex or they can submit to the FDA. Um, there are a lot of conversations about this in the community. And I think it's something that we take, we take very seriously. The registry, we don't really have it set up to collect this sort of data in an in a organized fashion. We do collect complications, but the tie to, to the various drugs is not tight enough to be to, to have confidence that what we find really is associated with the drug. So sort of a, a rambling answer, but the, the bottom line is it's always important to track the adverse events, particularly the serious adverse events but it's really the, the pharmaceutical sponsor for the most part that's on the hook. And we refer to them in the FDA if, if something serious comes in that you know, we, we, we want them to be aware of. Can I piggyback a little bit? I know we're trying to get to lots of questions that um, just as Bruce said, we sort of want, we want to pay extra attention to this and, but also make sure it goes to the right channels. I think you asked specifically about some of the anxiety components and there's actually, it's interesting, we've actually engaged with our, our mental health leaders. There's actually a mental health advisory committee with physicians and nurses and asked them to brainstorm about other ways to be able to collect this data. Part of this was actually sending out a message to all the care centers that actually Bruce led the way on this saying, hey, if you do get reports, make sure you report this, right? Don't, uh, make sure you report this uh, to the manufacturer. They're required to actually bring this forward to the FDA. That way you can really, uh, really understand what the data looks like. And um, we'll get some additional insight in some of the other studies we talked about with Promise and some of these other things that we're you know, collecting and getting increasing experience. Um, so I think the nice thing is there's multiple channels for being able to keep track of this and we'll make sure, certainly if there's anything we learn, we'll be the first to say, hey, this is something we need to pay extra attention to. Right now, we're just trying to build those channels, particularly with some extra attention in that, uh, with that mental health committee. Um Bill, a follow-up question for you on ELOX, which is if this um, current phase of research is successful, when might trials start, clinical trials? So ELOX is actually in a clinical trial right now. So they're testing patients, they're enrolling patients in their trial, and they're giving the drug and now monitoring them. So it's, it's a small trial, and we hope that that result will be done within the next, I would say, the first half of this year. But we'll just have to wait and see because enrollment is going to be a bit, of a, a bit of a question still. If that is positive, then it will go forward in a more advanced trial. They will be looking at outcomes and trying to understand how beneficial the drug is. So first, it's safety, you know, getting some idea of dose, and then really looking to see whether or not there's a clear clinical benefit. So we're in clinical trials now, moving forward, um, and we'll just have to see what the results show. Sir, can I add one thing just that Absolutely. that's a question that I don't know if has come through and that is really just this idea of could you participate in clinical trials and also get the vaccine? And the answer is yes. Each company is making decisions about this, but really everything we've heard so far, and I know specifically because this came up as a question with ELOX, 
that there's a statement that says you can get the vaccine and still go full speed ahead in the trial. So don't let that hold you back if you're interested. Great, great. Bill, there's also a question of, can we get the list of books on your bookshelf? So you <laughs> must have known that one was coming with your, your Zoom. I, I, my, my formal answer is you probably don't want the list of books on my book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope the text, I hope the titles are too small for you to actually read. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple uh, more questions. Obviously, a lot of excitement about this week's news around Trikafta for children um, ages 6 to 11. Um, Mike, maybe one for you. Any updates on when Trikafta, uh, Trikafta studies in children who are younger, ages maybe one to five or, or younger ages? Oh, you mean sort of for drug approval? Um, I yes. know those are actually starting to be planned because they actually already, uh, it's, a, it's a stair step where they're already planning the next one once they have the safety data of that younger group. So I think that's actually in the near future. Uh, the very near future. I don't have the exact, uh, this is JP Clancy might have exactly the dates, but it is, uh, it is imminent. Yeah, I think you're right, Mike. It's in that two to five-year-old category, and I think there's some dose finding, and uh, it's going to take some time. They're, they're really, uh, they're really careful at that, at that age, but um, Vertex definitely wants to move it down next into that two to five-year-old age category. One more Trikafta question is really related to, has, have we studied Trikafta in people who are post-lung uh, transplant? There's, def there's definitely use of Trikafta post-transplant and it's primarily not so much for the lungs, it's for uh, bad sinus disease or GI symptomatology, more of it used than, than you might expect. Um, and there's been interest in a study you know, our, our lung transplant consortium has tried to organize the idea and, and uh, possibly approach the CF Foundation or funding or perhaps even Vertex. We'd be interested in funding that. So there's interest. I'm, I'm not aware that there's actually a design clinical trial ready to launch, but a lot of discussion around it and quite a bit, quite a bit of use. Um. Lots of effort last year and, and commitment from the foundation around um, addressing the needs of um, people of color in the CF community. Mike, could you talk a little bit about the work that's going on there and, and what we can expect this year? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had a little hiccup in the internet, so hopefully I won't cause trouble. That, um, so this is something that uh, obviously was Something we said we want to really pay attention to this and we want to make sure that we have an inclusive approach to caring for for black and for people of color so that they uh both uh thinking about the science part uh the support part so we've actually uh, put a lot of energy into this this year and really have had sort of built out sort of two two communities some of this is looking within in our own house you know within the foundation of how can we can be uh have a racially just organization, but in, particularly in thinking about the people we serve, the community we serve, we've actually formed a committee that uh, includes uh, uh, caregivers, people of color, uh, outside experts, some of our own staff, with the idea of saying, how can we use data? How can we use programs? Um, how can we use science to try to help with any of the uh, sort of the differences in outcomes. And so this is, this is a big project, right? We've already been doing some work on this, but um, it's actually been a very uh, uniting experience to have these uh, groups coming together. They've been meeting regularly to think about those different areas of, of using data to better understand how we can develop some of these programs and um, so, you know, some neat things in science. You know, for instance, I don't know, Bill could actually maybe comment a little bit about uh, some of the therotyping has potential to really make a difference for people of color. Uh, with rare mutations. I don't know if you want to mention that, Bill. Yeah, I would say that we've looked at these rare mutations and the distribution is very different, as you might expect, than the distribution we see for Delta F5 weight and some of the more common mutations. We're looking into that more carefully to understand just exactly who will benefit and what the, what the ratios are. But it's pretty clear that, that if you have these rare mutations, the, the genetic background is quite different. And I think that also translates into racial and ethnic backgrounds as well. So really important to try to push those forward. Um, maybe one last COVID related question and, and then we'll begin to wrap up. But there is a question just generally, Bill or Bruce, you shared the numbers around how people 
are, are doing. Um, do we have any insight into why that is? Is it because people with CF are, are just do such a great job with maintaining physical distance and, um, and following sort of the steps that we need to take? Or is there anything related to CF itself that may be impacting COVID outcomes? Yeah, that's a good question. Not that I'm aware of, but I, you know, Bill, Mike may know more from the basic science front. I know there's been, you know, exploration in in this area, but, you know, I think, you know, as you were alluding to, people and families with CF, they know infection prevention and control. They've been at it for many years. I think that has really paid off, and the CF patient population skews to a, a younger uh, a younger age, which I think is is beneficial. But we do see these risk factors that I that I mentioned in the presentation of those with advanced lung disease and post transplantation do seem to be at risk for serious outcomes, and that's the group that you know we worry about everyone, but we're particularly we particularly worry about them and COVID. Can I make just one comment? Early on, we, we were looking at the receptor that the, the virus binds to a particular protein on the cell called the ACE2 receptor. And so we looked at the lab data that we had on cells from normal people and from CF individuals, and the ACE2 receptor is actually a little bit different. Now, does that really reflect why patients do differently in the clinic? That's a really good question. But there's some fundamental biological questions that we're working on now to really test whether or not there are basic differences that can explain how people respond and whether that might translate into other types of, of approaches to the, to the disease and, and how they're treated. Great, thank you. So maybe to wrap us up tonight, a question for, for all of you, and I think we'd love to hear um, each of your answers. Um, we are still at the start of a new year, it's still January. Um, what are you most hopeful about for the CF community mm -hmm. in 2021? Um, and maybe Mark, we'll start with, with you and, and go through um, our speakers in order. All right. Uh, I think I'll keep it simple. I think I've used C with quote marks multiple times tonight. And what I hope for in 2021 is that I can take the quote marks off and see some of you. Uh, you guys are the, the, the fuel. Um, you're, the, you're, you're the fuel in our engine that keeps us going and keeps us inspired and keeps us motivated. And we miss seeing you. So I'm going to keep it simple and say, I hope we actually see you. Bruce, I'm going to pass it over to you. What are you most hopeful about for the CF community in 2021? Oh, one word, vaccine for everybody that needs and wants one. That, that's our, that's our uh, get out of jail card free. And the sooner, the sooner, the better. I think I'm, already, I'm seeing the love for that one in the chat already, Bruce. I think there's a lot of excitement. We're, we're, we're eager for it. Um, Bill, how about you? Totally agree with Bruce. But from the scientist's perspective, three things that I'm really, really give me hope. One is the pace of the science. One is the dedication of the CF workforce. The people out there working on CF are so dedicated. And the other is the real interest that we have in industry and brilliant scientists to come help us solve our problems. All three of those things work together and it's just amazing to see this go forward. I guess I'm. I guess I'm last, Sarah. We uh, we actually didn't compare notes on this ahead of time. I was actually uh, part of the reason I'm hopeful is we're going to get through COVID-19, right? This is going to be something that there'll be some some you know adjustments we make along the way, but we're absolutely going to get through this. And the end of 2021 is going to look completely different than the beginning of 2021. But I'll also just maybe I'll return back. The reason to be hopeful is those the first two words I gave, sort of vision and determination. You've heard the vision tonight. You've heard it later, all the things that are going on, all the things we're working on. And I just know the determination of the group you've heard from, from our team, most importantly, everybody's on this, uh, on the call tonight. And uh, that combination is gonna make 2021 a remarkable year. Great, thanks everybody. Um, with that, I think we're gonna conclude our program. We will have a recording um, of the event with captions. I know that is something that there is a lot of interest in uh, and that we will be sending that out to everyone who registered for the event. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Good night, everybody. Good night, thank you. Good night, everyone, thank you.